hello 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 guys and welcome back to joe's ventures and today we're doing another episode of our planet and zoo mod spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods that people have been making and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with so today we're doing part 120 so really uh getting up there in parts but still some really awesome mods to cover so cannot complain so um we're gonna be starting off today we've got a dinosaur We've got quite a few mammals today as well, a couple of antelopes, a rodent, a couple of whales and stuff like that. I know you guys love your whales. So we're going to be starting off today with the rodent. We've got the Lowland Parker here done by Jen and Bubbly Worms. Uh, really, really cool animal. So the Lowland Parker was also known as the Spotted Parker. These guys are quite a large rodent found in tropical and subtropical uh, America. So they can be found pretty much from like Mexico down into Central and parts of like Uruguay. It's kind of the most southern part of their range. And they have been introduced into Algeria and Cuba, so what quite a wide range there. So the animal is called a parka by most of his range, but they also have all sorts of different names by different places. For example, the Tetsakutl is the original name for the Aztec language uh, that was for it. Also the Jaleb or the Yucatan Peninsula is the name for it. And there's a bunch of other names, I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have the time, but still really, really cool. There was much confusion about its nomenclature, so it was considered kind of like an agouti, as agoutis kind of refer to the general name of the Dasiprocta, which is the Central American kind of agouti that we all know and love. And um, they they originally now given their own name, kind of their own genus name as well. Uh, Kula, uh, Kuni Kalungus, uh, is, I believe, is their name, and is kind of their, their genus name now. And the word Parker comes from the Tapuni language, which means awaken or alert, which is quite uh, interesting because these guys are always alert, alert and always watching out for predators. The uh, Tepez uh, or of the uh, Aztec origin means mountain dog, so it's quite interesting. So you can see here, these guys have quite a coarse fur with uh, without an under fur, I mean, dark brown and black kind of top with a whiter yellowish underbelly. And they also have three to five rows of white spots down its side. And then it can be look good across a dark background. And they have thick, strong legs with four digits on them that they use for like digging. And they have nails that function off like hooves. They are short and quite, um, they are short and hairless. And their arch is kind of quite big. The zygomatic arch, which holds all the muscles, they have quite a big, uh, um, for holding muscles. And then they also use it as a resonating, a resonating chamber as well, which is really weird among a lot of mammals. And the, Adult lowland parker can get quite big. They're one of the biggest rodents. They're up there, like a little bit bigger than agoutis and things like that, but smaller than most large porcupines and beavers and capybaras, of course. They get up to 6 to 12 kilograms, or about 13 to 26 pounds, and each litter has like one baby, or sometimes two, and they usually have one to three young per year with a gestation period of 100 to 120 days. They're typically sexually mature at about a year of age, and they are can live until about 13. So in terms of the habits uh, or habitat, these guys are typically mostly nocturnal and solitary and they don't vocalize very much. They live in forested habitats near water, uh, prefer preferably around smaller rivers, and they'll dig burrows up to two meters deep below the surface with more than one exit. And they can sometimes actually live in the burrows of other animals as well. And they're quite a good swimmer and they usually head to water to escape from danger. And they can stay underwater for several minutes and are very good climbers. So they're kind of the general all around really good animal. Um, they are considered a very important speed, uh, seed disperser, like many other species of uh, rodents and large mammals and animals in the forests. Uh, they will eat leaves, stems, roots, tubers and nuts. They'll be known to eat like avocados, mangoes, uh, hog plums and guavas and things like that. Introduced species will also be eaten and they'll even sometimes store food. And they have uh, necrophagia behavior, so they'll sometimes eat dead decaying animals, which is like to supply protein to their diet. And in terms of the economic aspects, uh, these guys can be considered agricultural pests uh, because they eat lots of yams and sugar cane, things like that. The meat is also highly prized and they're plentiful in their protected habitats and they're considered least concerned. So they're not in danger of becoming extinct, but if it gets out of hand, uh, it could have potentially be a danger, especially with habitat destruction is a big issue. They can be easily raised and bred in farms, which is another good thing. Although they're considered to be kind of taste inferior when farmed, they taste better from the wild apparently. And some of the lowland packers predators include quite a few animals, including cats, jaguars, coyotes, bush dogs, uh, crocodiles, and boa constrictors. So quite a, and a wide range of predators, but still a really, really cool animal. You can see slightly different colors there. Very, very pretty. So Jenna Jora Pizza did that. Really, really awesome one. Next up, 
we have got the Blue Diker by Leaf and Mark. So these are a really, really cool little uh, antelope here. So the Blue Diker is a small antelope found in Central, Eden and Southern Africa. And it's also considered the smallest species of Diker. So in terms of their uh, relatedness, they were first described by Swedish naturalist Carl Peter Thunberg in 1789, which is quite interesting. In terms of taxonomy, they got the uh, scientific name uh, Phalantoba monoclora, which is uh, placed in the same genus with a couple other dikers, and they're bovidae, so they're related to uh, other dikers and things like that. Their generic name has no clear origin. It's believed to be a monocle, so mountain inhabitant is kind of their name. So they're kind of the blue mountain inhabitant, you could say, or blue mountain diver, which is quite interesting, as they will dive into vegetation to kind of get cover and hide and things like that. So, um, as I mentioned, they're related to the Maxwell and Walters diker, and there's been as many as 16 subspecies described, with several major populations kind of around the different uh, countries of Africa. They're quite a wide range of species. And there's kind of divided into two. There's a sub subspecies like the grey leg species and the red leg or southern subspecies. So they could be potentially split into seeds. They could be the northern blue diker and the southern blue diker. But taxonomy neither here nor there. But as I mentioned, these guys are a small antelope. They are the smallest antelope. Their head to body length is typically about 55 to 90 centimeters or 22 to 20, 35 inches. And they typically reach 32 to 41 centimeters or 31, uh, 30 to 16 uh, inches long. And have a shoulder... Uh, at the shoulder so they're about a little over a foot tall and they weigh between 3.5 to 9 kilograms or 7 to 19 pounds and sexual dimorphic the females are slightly larger than the males and they are quite characteristic by that really flat forehead they've got going on um, large eyes small ears and uh, white lips uh, a broad mouth and agile uh, legs uh, agile lips and their dark tails are slightly above 10 centimeters long uh, and the remarkable feature is they have a row of white uh, hair coming down either flank that reflects light which allows them to kind of uh, look like a luminous signal in a dark habitat that's really really interesting and there's lots of variation between the different subspecies of diker which is quite interesting like the more northern one tends to have like a shade of brown brown and black on its coat and the they have that and there's difference with the southern subspecies which is more reddish probably to do with uh different habitats since the more south you go it typically becomes more hot and uh, even different habitats like forests and things like that which is really cool in terms of behavior these guys are diurnal so they're active during the day and they're quite secretive and cautious so they're kind of uh, confine themselves to forest fringes and they're territorial with individuals have of a opposite sex kind of forming pairs and then maintaining territories just keep it between 0.4 to 0.8 hectares and they mark them with their pre-orbital uh, scent glands so they have scent glands right above their eyes that they use to secrete things like that they'll rub them on trees and logs to mark their territory and they have a vote they're quite vocal as well they'll actually give bird like uh chirps to denote curiosity which is quite as well they love yelps like typical of cats of districts or yells and a female not an estrus will avoid a male's advances maybe let out a whistling call which is quite interesting so in terms of their diet these guys typically feed on fallen fruits foliage flowers bark and provide uh provided mainly by the forest canopies they'll even eat fungi resin things like that and they will also be included in their diet like they'll live and sustain themselves on dead foliage better than other Durka species and some actually a study in the 1990s suggested that these guys eat about 70 percent leaves while fruits and seeds were about 73 percent of their diets and things like that so that's really really cool so let's have a look at the little guys in terms of reproduction let's have a look at these little guys for reproduction well that's the female we don't want to talk to her we want to talk about the baby there's the baby so age of sexual maturity uh is been gained from like different studies they estimated that these will become mature at about 13 months but also males will take longer about 13 to 14 months they're also a monogamous species so the pairs will remain together throughout the year the length of the gestational period is estimated to be about four months and as long as seven months so it depends on who you ask really the former estimates was kind of given by observations in the congo and births will occur throughout the year and though the birth rate may actually fall during the dry season the calves will typically start moving on its own within 20 minutes of birth as is known about uh, thrice a day or three times a day it is kept hidden for most of the time and the nursing individuals become a regular towards weaning and that occurs about two and a half to three months of age males will visit the uh, mates occasionally though they'll disappear for a month uh, after the calf's birth to protect the calf and postpartum estrus occurs about three to five days 
So as I mentioned, these guys are quite interesting, as in they quite like... Let's see, we, where are you there? There's a male there. Let's see, look at the female since it's slightly bigger. There's a female there, quite big in. Um, they can survive in a variety of forests, like old growth forests, things like that, that they prefer to be around the edges, and they're like ones with dense understories. And they can be found in all sorts of different countries, like uh, Angola, Cameroon, Central African Republic, the Congo, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, down to South Africa and Sudan, and uh, Uganda and Zambia, places like that. So quite a wide range. And in terms of their conservation, they are considered uh, least concerned, so they're quite problem uh, common. Though they are threatened, though their populations are stable, they are threatened by bushmeat, extensive bushmeat across their range. And they claim that the blue dike is actually has the greatest uh, economic as well as ecological significance of any African ungulate. You'd think there'd be like big animals like elephants and rhinos and things like that, but it's actually the blue dike that's quite important in that regard. And blue dike meat is actually quite an important source of protein for a lot of animals, a lot of people within their range. And they can survive to fight to, despite human interference, so they're doing quite well even with that. So we may be tentatively hopeful that there could be sustainable like harvesting in blue diker, which is quite interesting. But yeah, really, really cool animal. Definitely love that. Again, done by Leaf and Mark. Mark does all sorts of really wonderful ungulates and all that. So next up, we got by Leaf and Nicholas Line Rider. We've got the Rims Gazelle. So another cool gazelle coming up. So also known as the Slender Horn Gazelle or the African Sand Gazelle, these guys are quite a pale uh, coated gazelle with long slender horns that are quite well adapted to desert life. So um, they were named by Richard Leiker, which was Rim, known as Algerian or Liberia, which basically means the white gazelle. And the Rim comes from the Hebrew term Reb found in the Bible, which may refer to the Oryx, uh, an Oryx, Oryx, or potentially the unicorn, so that's quite interesting. In terms of their description, these guys get about 100 to 100, 101 to 116 centimeters long, or about 40 to 46 inches. They are the palest of all the antelopes, and they're quite well adapted to desert life. The upper parts of their kind of uh, pale bluff, as you can see, uh, and cream, as well, the underparts are also kind of a lot whiter with a kind of a dark stripe. The horns in the males, you can see, are quite slender, and they have a slight S shape, though the females' ones tend to be even thinner, lighter, and uh, nearly straight. So we'll have a look at a female for comparison. See, that's a female. You can see that's pretty much straight in comparison. They are. They also have fainter facial markings and stripes than a lot of other species of antelope. And the tail is kind of brownish black and about 15 centimeters long. And with contrast with their quite pale rump, which is interesting. So in terms of their habitat, these guys are known from Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and uh, Egypt. And they've been reported in Niger and Chad, but they have believed to live in isolated pockets across the Central Saharan Desert. So quite an interesting range for there. The extreme heat of their environments kind of typically like lets their to, limits their feeding to be between like early morning and evening but they gain most of their water requirements from uh the moisture of the plants that they eat so that's also quite interesting they're also quite nomadic so they move across the desert looking for um vegetation but they don't have a set migratory pattern typically live in sand dunes and rocky areas as well so quite a wide interesting range for these guys so one interesting uh, adaptation they have as well for surviving in the desert is called heterothermy, which is uh, basically is no longer letting the animal keep its body temperature within a narrow range. So it lets their body increase during the heat of the day, and that reduces the amount of time the, they need to evaporate to stay cool. So basically it lets their body overcook, so uh, they don't need to evaporate uh, it's like sweat and evaporate water to keep cool. So they let that happen, and it conserves water. And by reducing the evaporation, it reduces the energy and expenditure and conserves body water. And during the cooler temperatures of the night, the stored heat can be released, allowing the body temperature to go back down. And the rooms gazelles contain a, a normal skin temperature about 35 degrees in, in, the, in the summer and 25 in the winter. And when heterotomy is employed, these guys can uh, body temperature can increase by 5 to 20 degrees Celsius depending on the seasonal conditions. So these guys are also sadly an endangered species. They were endangered since the early 1970s because they were in serious decline. They were hunted firstly because they wanted to be mounted uh, then by motorized hunters for sport meeting their horns, which were sold as ornaments in North African markets. And threats now include poaching, loss of suitable habitat, and disturbance by humans. With the IUCN kind of estimated now there's only about 300 to 600 mature individuals in the wild, which is considered them endangered. So sadly quite an endangered species. But yeah, really, really cool animal. Definitely a big fan of them. 
So, next up, we have got an extinct animal. This was done... Uh, the Rim Gazelle was done by Leaf and Nicholas Linerider. This was done by TNT and Leaf. Good old TNT. We have got the common Lambiosaurus, or Lambiosaurus Lambi. So, Lambiosaurus is a genus of hadrosaurid uh, dinosaurs. So, these guys come from uh, the Lake Cretaceous as well, from North America. Or the Lake Companions, about 75 million years ago. And a really, really interesting animal as well. So it was first discovered in 1902 by Loris Lambi and uh, was considered another species and then it got its own name, Lambisaurus Lambi, to honor, honor the name as well of uh, Lawrence Lambi who discovered it. And it had been, this, it's had a long taxonomic history, there's been named other dinosaurs, but the most recent taxonomic kind of thing is there's two species, there's Lambi which is seen here and um, Marges, uh, what does it say? I need to find it. Uh, Marginocritis, or be something like that. But now there's typically two species, and a lot of various specimens were assigned to be their own species. But now you can see there's sexual dimorphism, that's what it's been attributed as, and also age. So you can see this is a female, a little bit uh, less impressive, and the male's got a much bigger impressive crest. And you can see how it grows up as well, as we look at the cute little baby over here. So these cute little babies don't have much of a crest, and you can see how it grows up throughout their lives, which is quite interesting. So that's the two species model. Uh, in terms of description, they were quite similar to species like Carithosaurus. If you've seen Jurassic Park, you'll know those. Um, they've got a quite interesting crest. It almost looks like a thumbs up, you know, or like on Facebook, a thumbs up, which is quite interesting. And like other species of hadrosaurs, they've got quite big tails with ossified tendons that keeps them straight. Uh, they've also got recently there was a discovery that they have uh, like almost hooves. They've got these two like claws there that look like hooves there, which is really, really interesting. They're four-legged, big beaks uh, with lots of keratin, these interesting crests and very cow-like superficially. So that's really, really cool. And in terms of classification, they're in their own group called the Lambiosauridae. So it's a subfamily within the hadrosaurs. And they're quite closely related to animals such as Carithosaurus and uh, Hippocratosaurus. Also, Nipponosaurus and Amosaurus and Allura Titan are kind of relatives of the Lambosauridae, those are animals that it's related to, which is quite interesting. Um, in terms of paleobiology, these guys were hadrosaurus, so they would be feeding on plants a lot. They were large quadrupeds, uh, and it's all bipeds. Whether they, how much time they spend on two or four legs is kind of uh, debated, but they were large herbivores, so they would be eating lots of plants. And they actually convergently evolved the way of ch chewing that was quite similar to mammals as well. So that allowed them to break down plants. And their teeth would have been constantly replaced in a dental battery, so they would have been constantly been able to chew and eat as well. And each battery would have had a handful of teeth, which only a relative handful would use at any time. They'd use it to uh, break material, things like that, and they would held, hold it in their jaws with like a cheek-like organ, which is quite cool. Uh, they would have believed to feed up to four meters off the, off the ground as they also Lambiosaurians may have had uh, more narrower beaks than uh, other hadrosaurs So these guys may have been slightly more selective feeders, maybe more browsing uh, in comparison Which is quite cool uh, In terms of cranial crest, as I mentioned, there was lots of species described But they all lumped because they realized there were different age stages or sexes of uh, Lambiosaurus, a uh, Lambiosaurus lambi, which is quite interesting so these guys would have quite a distinctive crest. Uh, no one really knows the function of it. They believe it could have hold uh, salt glands, improved their sense of smell. Uh, because it was connected to the uh, respiratory system, so they would have been able to breathe through it. Uh, things such as like snorkels or air traps, uh, things like that, or a resonating chamber to make bigger sounds. And also another feature these guys have are quite large eyes with large cloak rings that suggest these guys may have had quite good eyesight which when they lived during the day and also quite strong sense of hearing very similar to that like that of a crocodile with a strong in area things like that so quite uh well adapted to um seeing and smelling and hearing so they're quite most of their senses were quite well adapted in terms of their habitat uh, Lambosaurus lambi uh, and both species of Lambosaurus lived in the dinosaur park formation which is quite well documented and is filled with all sorts of famous dinosaurs so such as uh, Ceratosaurus, uh, not Ceratosaurus, um, Centrosaurus, Therachosaurus and uh, Champsosaurus, uh, Chasmosaurus I mean also things like Procerolophus, Parasaurolophus, Gorgosaurus, Edmontonia, uh, Corythosaurus, Gorgosaurus, uh, Yoposephalus as well they all would have lived together in this very interesting ecosystem which would have been a lot of rivers and floodplains uh, 
which would become more swampy as they kind of moved out into the West Interior Seaway, which was a big seaway that separated America in half. Um, they would have been actually the, the found in Alberta, so they would have been in southern Canada, but it would have been much warmer than it was today, so they wouldn't have had frosts. And conifers were the kind of the dominant plants. There were like lots of ferns and angiosperms and things like that starting to appear, which is really, really interesting. And the main way that you can kind of tell them apart of both species is that Lambie and Muscratisus is kind of, and Carithosaurus are all separated from stratigraphy, so how they're placed in the rocks. So Carithosaurus is the oldest, found a lower two-thirds of the formation. Lambiosaurus lambi is found in the upper third, and Muscratisus is rare and only present on the very top, so would have probably uh, been the latest and greatest. You could say Lambie evolves into Muscratisus and all that. But yeah, really, really cool animals. Really do love good old Lambiosaurus. But look at this little cutie. I've got to have a look at this guy here. Look at how cute he is. Adorable. Love the little man. Little baby Lambiosaurus. Adorable. Okay, that was done by TNT and Leaf. Next up, we've got another remaster. We've got the Eurasian Brown Bear. So let's have a look at these guys. This was done by Havoc1119 and good boy. So the Eurasian Brown Bear. Got a bit of an update. So the Eurasian Brown Bear, or Ursus Arctos Arctos, is the most common species uh, of brown bear. One of the most common and typically found throughout much of Eurasia. They're also called the European brown bear, or just the common brown bear, or even just the common bear, uh, typically. So these guys have brown fur, as they get their name from, but it can range from yellowish brown to dark brown, reddish brown, and even black in some cases, with also albinism being recorded, so completely white. Their fur is quite dense with varying degrees, and their hair can grow up to 10 centimeters, or 3.9 inches in length. Their head is normally quite round, and has relatively small, rounded ears, a wide mouth, and... Uh, with equipped with 42 a white skull and a mouth equipped with 42 teeth including some predatory teeth as most bears are omnivores they've got quite powerful bones uh, and also muscles and uh, large claws that can get up to about 10 centimeters or three inches each and their weight will vary depending on their habitat or the time of year but a full-grown male can be anywhere between 250 and 300 kilograms uh, or 550 to 660 pounds, and reach up to a maximum weight of 481 kilograms, or a little over a thousand pounds, and a length of 2.5 meters or 8 feet long. Typical females are typically a little bit smaller; they get about 150 to 250, or up to 550 pounds, and typically will have a lifespan of 20 to 30 years in the wild. So, in terms of the history, these guys. Uh, not too different in terms of ecology and stuff like other bears, but we know how they've kind of changed to antiquity. So the um, in ancient Rome, they would have been used for uh, kind of fighting in arenas. And in antiquity, these guys were a lot more carnivorous than they were now. So back then, it was believed to be uh, animals and like meat was kind of 80% of their diet. But now, as like the habitats diminished, uh, during the Middle Ages, meat was only about 40% of their diet. And now into today, they only eat about 10 to 15% of their diet as meat. So that's a great change of how they moved to survive with people becoming more prevalent. In their habitats and whether possible these guys will eat sheep and unlike in north america where uh grizzly bear will kill like an average two people a year these guys are a lot more uh, uh secretive and a lot less likely to attack people there's only been reports of three fatal bear attacks within the last century however in late 2019 there was a brown bear that killed at least three men in romania in just over a month so pretty much like a freak accident so the oldest fossils we have of uh, Eurasian brown bears are about half a million years ago, or 500,000 years ago. And it's known from DNA that the Ice Age was too cold for brown bears to survive, typically in Europe, except for three places, Russia, Spain, and the Balkans. But um, more recent evidence of the genetics suggests that these guys were able to track them over time. So they were seen develop more than the 50,000 years, and they would have separated out of 50,000 years ago with some in different places, things like that. And it's kind of two major clades. There's one in the Iberian Peninsula, and one in the Balkans, and, the, and, and another in Russia. So quite an interesting range there. There actually is a population in Scandinavia that's like a mix of these. So they believe to be bred together and probably moved to, around together during the last Ice Age as well. So it shows that there's lots of the habitats are constantly and ranges are constantly moving and changing as the world changes, which is quite interesting. So in terms of distribution, these guys can be found mostly across Eurasia compared to their more limit. They used to be found more, but now they've got more limited range, and but they too live like to live in a varied habitat. So like wet, uh, wetlands, grasslands, forests, things like that. They're quite generally uh, general in that regard. 
So that they were, although they were considered least concern in 2006, local populations have been incredibly scarce just because people don't want to live with bears pretty much uh, because of hunting. They became extinct in the British Isles about 1,500 years ago, or potentially even 3,000 years ago. Denmark about 6,500 years ago. 1,000 years ago, they became extinct in the Netherlands. And there have been more recent extinctions. Like in Germany, they went extinct in 1835. And the most recent kind of extinction was Portugal. Though there have been sightings of bears wandering back as the hunting pressures have kind of uh, gone off them and more conservation effort to protect these bears. They're starting to like kind of recolonize some of these areas. The largest population is the Ural Mountain Range, which is in Siberia. And the largest known uh, bear population in Europe is in Russia. With populations getting between uh, like 3,000 bears in Sweden, 2,000 in Finland, 1,100 in Estonia, and about 100 in Norway. And there's a large population including Romania, which is at 6,000 bears, and uh, Slovakia has about 1,200 bears. Croatia and stuff like that, they all have about 1,200 bears. And there's some significant populations around the place. And there's some small population, like in the Pyrenees, there's a population of 70 bears growing and things like that. So they are kind of uh, trying to conserve them, and they are doing better in that regard. And to speak of that, look at these cute little cubs. Look at these cuties. How adorable is this little man? Let's see if you can find the other one here. Little cutie bears. Really, really awesome. So, yep, then we're going to move on now. So, next up, we've got uh, another remaster. This was done by Leaf, Buffsu, and Jen. We've got a couple of cetaceans coming up, but we've got the narwhals swimming in the ocean, causing a commotion because they are so awesome. So, yeah, this is the narwhal, also known as the narwhale, uh, or Monodon monoceros. Uh, these guys are a medium sized whale and they possess a large tusk, which comes from a canine tooth. And they live in the Arctic uh, and live there year round, around like Russia, Greenland, and Canada. So let's talk about these guys. So Narwhal, kind of described by Linnaeus in 1758, which name comes from basically Narrow Corpse, because they almost look like they're decomposing because they have mottled pigmentation they've got. And uh, the species named Monodon, so it's basically corpse tooth. Uh, one horn tooth as well, so it's quite interesting. And the other closest living relative is the beluga whale, which we'll be talking about shortly. And they are decent size. So narwhals are medium size in terms of whales. They are about the same size as beluga whales. Uh, total length for both sexes, including the excluding the tusks, uh, can range between three point nine five to five point five, or thirteen to eighteen feet in length. With males that are about four point one meters, or about thirteen point five, are slightly larger than females with an average length of 3.5 meters or 11 and a half feet. Typical adult body weight ranges from 800 to 1600 kilograms or 1700 to 3500 pounds with males uh, typically attaining a sexual maturity at about 13 or 11 years of age at about 3.9 meters or about 12 feet long with females getting sexual mature a little bit younger, a little bit smaller with between 5 to 8 years old and about 3.4 or about 11 feet long. So you can see they've got quite a mottled pattern to them, as you can see there, which is like blackish brown markings with a lilac underside. And they are darkest when they're born. So when you see the baby ones, let's look at the baby ones here, they're basically born dark black and kind of develop as they age. And uh, one thing as well, these guys don't have a dorsal fin, unlike a lot of other species of whales, which is quite interesting. Probably to help with sw uh, swimming under ice so they don't get caught in ice and things like that. And... Um, and the neck vertebrae is also jointed like those of land mam mammals and unlike most whales which is quite interesting so it allows them to move their neck which is one thing that they share with uh beluga whales which is another cool fact and you can see the tail fluke of female narwhals are actually uh front edge and swept back though the males have the more concave which is quite interesting and it's believed to this is an adaptation to actually reduce dra drag from their tusks which is quite cool and the most uh common feature or the most uh surprising feature of the narwhal as you can see especially in the males are these tusks so they have a it's in fact a canine tooth and it projects from the left side of the upper jaw and is and through a lip and has like a uh, hemical spiral to it and the tusk will grow continually through the life of the narwhal and uh, can reach lengths between 1.5 to 3.1 meters or about 4.9 to 10 feet and it's hollow and weighs about 10 kilograms and one in 500 narwhals will actually have two tusks where both will erupt and kind of have double tusks and uh, only about 15 percent of females will also grow a tusk which is typically smaller than the males and a less notable spiral 
And people have been wondering for decades what the heck was the use of this, but we actually recently kind of figured this out. So it was originally believed to be like an acoustic organ or a weapon or trying to open like sea ice and break sea ice for breathing holes and uh, tusks and also a secondary sexual characteristic that was kind of the believed one. So the males with the biggest uh, tusk would be the, like, the most desirable male. But recent studies actually show that these guys would have used them for feeding. So they kind of would have... Um, use them to uh, bash into kind of fish so they would use the tap and stun cod which make them easier to feed which is quite interesting and it's also believed to be quite a sense a tense sensory organ so they have up to like millions of nerve endings within it so that allows them to detect the external ocean uh, a little bit better so they're quite sensitive and um, it's believed that uh, females we do not talk actually live longer than males so it's uh, this is believed to be a sexual trait at least so while they can use them for hunting this is primarily a sexual trait so they would have very similar to the antlers of a stag or the male of a lion a mane of a lion or a feathers of peacock things like that as well so in terms of their habitat these guys are found primarily around the arctic and russian areas of the arctic ocean they can be found up to hudson bay baffin bay things like that svalsbard franz joseph land and things like that pretty much high in the arctic in terms of behavior these guys are quite social uh they congregate in groups of about five to ten and sometimes up to 20 individuals and these groups will have females and young with some actually they're having bulls but mixed group can occur any time of the year in summer they'll often form larger aggregations of about 500 to even a thousand individuals and then this time, these males will kind of rub their tusks with bulls, and it's known as tusking, and it's sought to maintain like social dominance hierarchies. However, this has been used as sensory and uh, communication organ, and they may be actually sharing information about water chemistry and things through the uh, tusk, which is quite interesting. In terms of migration, these guys exhibit seasonal migrations with high fidelity, so they prefer ice-free swimming, uh, summering grounds usually in shallow water. In the summer months, they move coast to coast in pods up to a hunt, one to ten to a hundred, and then in the ice winter, they'll move up shore under the pack ice, and they'll surfacing a narrow fish in the sea ice and things like that. And when spring comes, uh, comes they get it typically get led out by channels into the coastal bays and do it all over again. In terms of diet, they do have a relatively restricted diet compared to most uh, whales and stuff like that. They feed predominantly on polar and arctic cod, halibut, cuttlefish, uh, squid as well. But they will eat things like wolfish, capelins, gate eggs, will eat uh, as well. And due to the lack of well-developed digestion in the mouth, they believe that they will swim, uh, believe to feed by swimming towards their prey and sucking them in. They use suction feeding. And a sort like beak whales, they similarly reduce digestion, also will suck up their prey with this. And they also have a very intense summer feeding strategy. So one study actually showed that they kind of um, stomach contents these guys with the Arctic cod made up about 50% of their uh, diet of narwhals with the rest being like halibut and things like that. So it really depends, but they typically like that kind of stuff. And uh, they typically uh, found polar cod and things like that in the diet of males, which means that narwhals can dive deeper than 500 meters or about 1600 feet in the water, which is quite interesting. And when in wintering waters, they actually make some of the deepest dives of any marine mammal and dive at least 800 meters over 15 times a day. So 2,620 feet a day, with many dives being up to about 1,500 meters, which is quite interesting. And these dives can be around 25 minutes, things like that, and vary. It depends on location. So they kind of, well, this will vary a lot depending on the population and habitat availability and things like that. But they are able to dive quite deep to catch food. And typical of most whales, they are quite communicative. They can use lots of whistles and clicks and knocks, and they have a melon, very similar to most other whales, that they can use to produce sounds to uh, both echolocate and produce sounds to kind of communicate with other whales. In terms of their breeding and lifestyle, um, let's see if we can find a baby. Let's have a look at that little baby here. Let's stop that one. Little baby over here. These little narwhals are kind of, uh, they begin to bear calves about six to eight years old with adult narwhals mating about april to may when they are on the offshore pack ice the station will last about 14 months and calves are generally born between june and april and as with most marine mammals uh these guys are typically born uh, by themselves and they could be uh, white or light gray in color as you can kind of see here and um during the summer months uh they often will prefer coastal inlets and things like that and um, indicate that higher calf counts may relate to calving. These often have these inlets as well. There's also been hybrids of narwhals and belugas being recorded as well, which is quite interesting. And But we haven't seen one living yet, which is also interesting. But um, yeah, 
They will begin their lives with a thin layer of blubber and then get thickened out as their mum kind of feeds them because their milk is rich in fat. Uh, calves are dependent on milk for about 20 months and the long lactation period of calves learns that the skills needed to kind of mature and they'll stay, stay away from them and then they stray when they're about two body lengths of their mother so about like what would say eight or nine feet or so. But in terms of their lifespan and mortality they've been known to live about 50 years on average which is based, uh, but it's believed that the kid is get as old as like 115 years or something like that. And most mortality often occurs if, if they uh, kind of uh, drown because they can suffocate if they don't get to the um, surface. So that's the main reason a lot of them die. But because they need to breathe, they drown if open water is no longer accessible to them if they can't break through the ice. The maximum swimming distance between uh, breathing holes is less than 1,400 meters, which limits their foraging ground. So they must stay within like a kilometer of a breathing hole, a breathing hole. And the last major entrapment event happened was no wind, and there was like there had been like six hundred individuals kind of trapped in these areas and kind of died, which is quite a scary thought actually. And in terms of their predate predators and hunting, uh, main predators of narwhals are polar bears, uh, but also young narwhals have been taken by Greenland sharks, and orcas have been known to overwhelm these pods in shallow water and can kill a lot of them. Humans also hunt narwhals, selling them for their skin their vertebrae their teeth and tusk and about a thousand are killed by year a year with uh, 600 in canada and 400 in greenland trying to be sustainably harvested and they can get quite expensive like uh one estimate for narwhal hunts can get like 300 uh 350 uh, dollars for uh narwhal hunt as well or six grand per narwhal which is quite interesting so that sustains their economy and one big issue for the conservation is one of the marine mammals threatened by human actions. The population has been estimated between 50,000 to 170,000, but they are considered sub uh, near threatened as they're mostly doing okay, but there are populations at risk and they are protected as well. Anyone able to legally hunt the species, but that, as I mentioned, that's kind of something that they do is try to do sustainably. They're quite important for uh, as, a, as a source of vitamin C and um, quite important for food for a lot of these people. And they're also one of the most vulnerable mammals to climate change in the Arctic because of the altering sea ice coverage. So, uh, especially in their northern wintering grounds. So what happens is that the narwhals have come from foraging believed to be patterns in their early life. So they have sight fidelity, so they like to return to places where they've been before. And since the champion conditions, they'll return to the same place during migrations. And due to the vulnerability of sea ice, they have some flexibility when it comes to sea ice and habitat selection. So it's believed they could be doing okay because they evolved in late Pleistocene, so they're moderately accustomed to periods of glaciation and kind of variability. And in terms of the uh, indirect danger of associated with changes in sea ice is increased exposure to open water, which means they could be more vulnerable to people hunting them as well. But luckily with the quotas... Uh, it's possible that this could actually start help that a bit and kind of since they're only allowed to kill a certain amount of narwhals it's it's kind of keeps it sustainable so that might not be a big of an issue but yeah they considered quite an important cultural uh, animal inuit kind of well the narwhal's tusk was created with a woman with a harpoon kind of roped around her waist and was dragged in the ocean by a narwhal she transformed into a narwhal and her hair was in a twisted knot which became the uh tusk and some medieval people believed the horns of narwhals or the tusks of narwhals were actually believed to be from a unicorn with them believed to have medicinal properties and all that but yeah they're quite a common thing people have mentioned it like herbie uh jules verne mentioned uh, that in the um genetic narwhal as well and also the moby dick was mentioned there but yeah really really interesting animal how can you not love narwhals definitely really really cool so this is done by leaf jen and Buffsu. all did a wonderful job uh, remaking the narwhal so next up uh, we have got their other close relative, done by the same people, Leaf, Buffsu, and Jen. We have got the beluga whale, so everyone's favorite sea canary. So really, really wonderful animal. So the beluga whale, also no, or um, Delta Terris lucas, if you say that, they're an Arctic or sub-Antarctic cetacean and one of the members of Monodon today, along with the narwhal. And also known as the white, uh, white whale, sea canary, or the melon head, which is quite interesting. Um, in terms of taxonomy, as I mentioned, uh, first described in 1776 by Peter Simone's Paul and belongs to the family Monodontidae along with the Norwal, which is quite interesting. Colloquially called the Sea Canary because they're quite high-pitched squeals and things like that, and Melonhead because they have quite large melons. And actually is believed to be one that kind of talked to people as they can kind of mimic human language a little bit, which is quite interesting. 
So yeah, really, really cool. In terms of evolution, it's believed these guys kind of split off from other groups of... Um, they share a common answer about 25 to 34 million years ago. These guys, uh, monodontids, split from dolphins and later porpoises uh, around like 11 to 15 million years ago, which is quite interesting. I'm not going to go too much in taxonomy because this is not to do with the uh, beluga, and we have a lot of beluga stuff to talk about, so we're not going to worry too much. In terms of description here, you can see they've got quite a round body that is particularly when well fed, and that taper is less smooth than a lot of other animals. They have a sudden tapering at the base of the neck and things like that. And they actually have shoulders, unlike a lot of other cetaceans. And they have tail fin that grows and becomes grippy ornated as the animal ages. And they've got quite broad flippers and look quite square shaped in that regard. In terms of their longevity, it's believed that these guys used to live more than 30 years, really. But um, it depends on their kind of, they use dentine to kind of calculate that and dental cement. And it's believed they deposited once or twice a year. But some, there's been some controversy of how long they can actually live. Some say 30 years, some estimates suggest like 70 to 80 years. I would say 70 to 80 years is probably more realistic considering narwhals. But you kind of don't really know for certain. In terms of size, they do have a moderate sexual dimorphism. So uh, males are typically about a quarter bit bigger than the females. Uh, uh, and are sturdier. Adult male belugas can range between 3.5 to 5.5 meters or 11 to 18 feet, while females measure 3 to 4.1 meters or 9.8 to 13 feet, with males also weighing about 1,100 to 1,600 kilograms or 11 to 18, uh, I mean 2,430 to 3,540 kilograms, and occasionally up to 1,900 kilograms or just under 2 tons or about 4,190 kilograms, while females weigh between uh, 700 and 1200 kilograms or 1500 to 2650 pounds and are ranked kind of mid-size along the size of tooth whales and individuals of both sexes will reach their adult size at about 10 years old and the beluga bodies you can see is shaped quite stocky and um, quite cone shaped as well and they're particularly fat about 40 to 50 percent of their body weight is fat uh, which is higher than most other cetaceans that do not have it uh, the Arctic, where fat's only about 30% of their weight. And this fat kind of covers their whole body except their head and can usually be up to 15 centimeters or about 5 inches thick. And it's used to insulate their body against the cold waters of the Arctic, which is quite interesting. And these guys are often really mistaken for other species because they're just bright white and there's not many species like that. And this is one thing that the mod got wrong. The babies are typically born gray, but these guys are still left white. And um, they they will become white at about a month of age and um, they start to lose their pigmentation and get their white coloration about seven to nine ye uh, years of females and nine years of males and this coloration is ad adaptation to help the camouflage with the polar ice caps to protect them from polar bears and killer whales and they also have quite thick skin they'll shed their skin during uh, the season and the epidermis is quite thick they can become yellowish which is quite interesting another really interesting about these head and neck of these guys they do have a melon very similar, so it's fatty tissue on the front of their head. Similar to narwhals, that allow them to make lots of sounds and echolocate. But similar to narwhals as well, are they able to have head and shoulders, so they're able to turn their neck and things like that, which is really, really interesting and probably pretty good adaptation for them. In terms of their fins, also they retain, like they have the connective tissue there that allows them to have their fins as well. And they actually are used as a rudder and kind of provide... Um, they also can be used to regulate their body temperature as they are able to lose or gain heat as they, uh, the vessels in their tails and things like that are used to get rid of or keep heat inside them, which is a really, really interesting adaptation that they have. So it's very important for them to keep nice and cool uh, or nice and warm during the, uh, either through the, through the warm summers or the cold winters and things like that. So you gotta be careful with that. In terms of their senses, as I mentioned, they've got very good sense of smell. And as I mentioned, they've got great, uh, not sense of smell, sense of uh, hearing. So quite good at hearing uh, because they make all those sounds and they can locate so they're able to use that to move around the water. And they're able to see as well. They have relatively poor vision compared to other dolphins, but they are able to see both in and outside of water as their eyes are actually quite well adapted for seeing in the water as they have a crystalline ledge as well. And the cornea is actually just to overcome the things like that. So they're well adapted for seeing underwater, but not quite as well underwater, uh, outside of water. But that's quite interesting. In terms of the behavior, these guys are quite social. They're highly sociable animals. And they live in groups of pods as well. They can live, and that could be between 2 to 25 individuals, up to a hundred, uh, 10 members uh, on average, but can be up to huge as they frequently get in big groups. 
These guys will even start out with a few pods a few days ago and be hundreds of miles away from that pod, so they kind of move around doing their own thing. They're not particularly tied to a pod. Uh, they can have three different categories. There's bachelor pods with just males, nurseries with mothers and calves, and then mixed pods with both males and females. And big congregations of hundreds or even hundreds of thousands of individuals will join into like uh, river estuaries during the summer where they kind of will molt and uh, hang out together as well. It's also when they're most vulnerable. There's also cooperative animals, so they frequently hunt in groups as a pod. They'll be able to use it to hunt together. And they'll often surface and dive together in a synchronized uh, manner, which is a behavior that is known as milling. But in captivity, they'll constantly play and vocalize each other. They'll blow bubbles and things like that. They've learned some kind of... Uh, they'll play with each other and uh, they'll display physical affection by mouth-on-mouth -mouth contact. So they basically kiss somewhat, which is quite cute. And they also have a great sense of curiosity to humans in the wild. So they frequently swim up the boats. There's a video of a woman dropping her phone and a beluga coming up to grab it, which is a really cute video. But um, they are quite curious, which is probably good or bad for them, depending. And during the breeding season, it also had actually been observed carrying plants, nests, or even dead reindeer on their heads and uh, backs as well. And captive females have been shown to, uh, they'll carry items like floats or buoys on them as well, which is quite interesting. And in captivity, uh, mo molt, uh, mothering behavior among belugas depend on individuals. Some are very great mothers, some are kind of eh and then they actually lost their calves so it depends on the personality of the mother it seems so these guys are quite slow swimmers compared to a lot of other species like common dolphins uh bottom dolphins, things like that because they're less hydrodynamic they will typically swim between uh five to ten percent of the time so they kind of swim on the surface five to ten percent of the time and they can swim between three to nine kilometers an hour and get as fast as about 22 kilometers an hour and they usually typically are not deep divers. They'll typically only dive to about 20 meters, but they're capable of diving between 400 and 647 meters and even 700 meters, with the greatest record being about over 900 meters. So quite similar to narwhals in that regard, but they don't, don't dive nearly as often, with uh, divings last between five, three to five or up to 20 minutes sometimes. In terms of diet, they've got quite an interesting diet. So they feed on rosefish, halibut, and shrimp. And also in Alaska, they'll feed on cold salmon. Uh, they're a little bit more generalist than uh, narwhals. So they eat a lot of everything. They're on the seafood diet. The seafood they eat it. But they'll eat clams, squid, bristle worms, all of that stuff. And the diet of Alaskan ones can be quite diverse. And animals in captivity eats about 2.5 to 3% of their body weight every day. So about um, 18 to 27 kilograms or 40 to 60 pounds a day. And like their wild counterparts, they found to eat least in the fall. They typically will forage on the seabed as well, or then they can dive up to 700 meters in search of food. Uh, their flexible net allows them to kind of uh, move around and get into the sediment to grab food, so it really helps with foraging as well. They've been known to like uh, join corrugated, uh, coordinated groups to kind of catch fish and shoal fish as well, so that's another interesting adaptation they have. So other adaptations these guys have is bleed to reach sexual maturity at about... Uh, 9 to 15 years old for females uh, it would be 8 to 14 for 8 it's 9 to 15 for males and 8 to 14 for females and they typically will first give birth at about 8.5 years old uh, though their fertility will decrease in the 25 and then they'll go through menopause with the oldest one there's no been reports of a female giving birth at older than 41 so they typically do that females give birth to a calf every 3 years with most mating occurring in February through May and they'll actually have delayed implantation, so they can kind of gestate when they've got better chances of having a baby. Gestation lasts about 12 to 14 months, uh, but information in captive females suggests they can be up to 15 months. And during the mating season, the testes will actually double in weight. And calves will often be born in a protected area that varies in location, so typically like secluded bay, such as Hudson Bay in, uh, in the Canadian Arctic. In other places, they'll often try to find a nice calm place to give birth uh newborns are typically about 1.5 meters long and they give birth in estuary and warm estuary as well and they weigh about 80 kilograms uh or 180 pounds and are mainly gray in color so they're able to swim along with their mother and they may uh nurse underwater and lactate and n initiate lactation right after about a few hours after being born and um, they will remain dependent on their mothers for the first year or so of their life uh and when their teeth appear and then they'll start to eat like small shrimp and things and then they continue nursing until they're about 20 months of age and occasionally sometimes more than two years and then they'll kind of go off and do their own thing once they get big enough and they will be actually they believe in alloparenting so they will have other mothers kind of 
abducting other baby belugas as well which is quite interesting and as i mentioned they use echolocation they'll make all sorts of different sounds they are known as the sea canary so they will make all sorts of different sounds to kind of uh communicate with each other and make sounds and things like that which is really interesting they have lots of whistles and things part of the reason why they're so popular in captivity because they make all sorts of cool uh, sounds and stuff so that's quite popular for them in terms of distribution as i mentioned they are circumpolar so they can be found across the arctic they can be found pretty much in all the parts of the world like alaska canada greenland and russia or places like that and they will migrate so they will typically migrate up to six thousand kilometers a year they will spend summer sites that are blocked in with sea ice in autumn and then they'll spend the winter at the open sea alongside the pack ice and things like that and use like ice holes to kind of breathe and then during the summer they'll come into like estuaries and kind of chill out and uh, be more around the coast to kind of breed and relax and things like that which is quite interesting so in terms of habitat quite varied habitat they're like fjords and things like that bays and things like that as i mentioned in the summer and out in the uh and in the winter they like to be out in the open ocean so they are considered i believe least concern let me check they are considered the at least concern so there's large populations the largest population is let me go back largest population is believed to be in james bay which is fourteen thousand individual uh uh, Western Hudson Bay, which is about 55,000 individuals, there's uh, lots of variation between where they are, but there is lots of uh, popular, um, they're quite common around those areas. There's about 22 stocks considered, but um, most of them are doing okay. Some are less endangered, but the overall population is about 200,000 or 150,000 animals, which is quite interesting. But the threats they face is hunting. People will hunt them for consumption and profit. They try to be sustainable, but uh, sometimes it just can't be sustainable just because they're a slow breeding animal. Uh, present ones they killed about a thousand per year was hunting quotas so they are managed they're really eaten for meat they are given to like dogs and things like that leave the rest for wild animals they may uh, others may drought the meat for consumption of humans things like that and what they will sell beluga tea things like that they are ha harvested sustainably at the moment but things like that but another big issue was commercial whaling that was a big issue for these guys um for their meat and blubber very similar to other whales and it peaked around like the uh, 1930s with the uh, 1960s about 7,000 per year a total of 86,000 from 90, 1915 to 2014 were hunted and kind of gone but um other issues is predation they get preyed upon by like killer whales they eat both young and adult belugas and also when uh when they're closer to the coasts polar bears can hunt them uh, contamination since they are a species that are kind of top of the ecosystem they will collect a lot of um, metals and things like that uh, ddt or lead and mercury in this system that can make some toxins to eat and also hurts their chances of reproduction and things like that so they are great to kind of figure out in the local ecosystem if the metals and things like that are bad uh, levels and things like that uh, also pathogens they're quite um so that the bottom of a lot of those as i mentioned they're quite prevalent in captivity they're among the first whale species kept in captivity and are one of the most popular ones uh though as i mentioned in general kind of marine mammals uh, like whales and stuff like that is keeping captivity is a bit dicey but um they're the one that's kind of the um whale species that's kind of most common in that regard like uh up there with kind of like bottlenose dolphins things like that but as as we get the controversy aside uh it's not really i would say there is there are places but that and i not necessarily that I don't disagree with it i just don't like that they're just kept in a often bare tank i wish there was more enrichment things like that um, not to start a debate or anything it's just personal opinion um and but they're quite common whale watching things like that people like to go see them they're quite common in marine parks and aquariums as i mentioned human speech uh is something they've been learned to male belugas have been known to mimic human speech they often shout like two uh children and one cat the beluga actually learnt to kind of uh, overheard divers using an underwater communication system and kind of learnt that and learnt it to mimic them which is quite interesting as i mentioned they were considered vulnerable now they're considered least concern because uh they believe to be doing okay in that regard but uh belugas there are sub threatened populations that uh like only a few hundred there so pretty much worried but other things that could be threats to them is sea ice is with climate change sea ice can disappear and that gets rid of the habitat and leaves them more open to hunting from both people and orcas uh they also use that orca to protect uh themselves from killer whales and feeding for fish they'll show fish into the ice to kind of catch them uh decline in their habitats and encasement and like leads and uh, freezing and things like that 
also like more fishing and that human activities up in the north of the world could potentially impact their populations you know more mining more fishing people get tangled in nets more pollution things like that which is things like that. but luckily they are leg- legally protected and there are conservation research and facilities which is kind of the silver lining of as i mentioned them in captivity there's places doing lots of research on them trying to increase their welfare things like that so it's not all bad but they're trying to work properly to try and manage these species and learn more about them to help protect their wild counterparts as they have quite an important part of culture both of us as they were uh Finding Dory, there was Bailey the beluga whale, and they're quite important for Inuit cultures and things like that, and quite famous in some zoos like the Vancouver Aquarium. Baby beluga was born in the Vancouver Aquarium, and also inspired the beluga kind of plane, you know, the Airbus beluga, which kind of really does look like a beluga. Really, really cool. So that's these guys done. So really, really awesome mod. Definitely a big fan of these guys. So um, yeah, nice to see Leaf and Jen kind of coming back and redoing some of the really awesome mods. So hope to see that baby changed but i think that would be really awesome regardless so um yeah i think this would be a great place to end the video so i really 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 hope you guys have enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of learning anything so yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye